Welcome to the inaugural lecture and celebration of Dr. David Setrin's appointment to the Price Labar Chair of Christian Education. What an auspicious date for such an event, two days after the Ides of March and St. Patrick's Day. Perfect timing for Dr. Osetrin's debut. <laughs> this afternoon, we have a special group assembled for this lecture, but most important, are members of the Christian Formation and Ministry Department. I'd like for all the members of the department to stand. And just remain standing. This is a group of dedicated and passionate teachers committed to Christian education, Christian formation, and Christian outreach to the church and beyond. These are people who take spiritual formation seriously. Could we show appreciation for their work in this? <laughs> Dr. Barrett McRae will be offering a formal introduction of our speaker this afternoon, but I do want to add this. One student's words about Dr. David Setrin's teaching, and I'm quoting them. Going beyond just being a fountain of knowledge, he teaches in such a way that his students are able to absorb what he says, take ownership of what they learn, and quickly apply it to their lives. His incredible level of approachability creates a classroom culture that is warm, providing a safe space for challenging discussion and critical thinking. And that is exactly what we will experience this afternoon. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, giver of all things, with gladness we give thanks for all your goodness. We bless you for the love which has created and which sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, through whom you have made known your will and grace. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and good people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that our Lord has done for us and enable us to show our thankfulness by lives that are wholly given to your service. O oh God of wisdom, in your goodness, you provide faithful teachers for your church. We ask that you give all teachers insight into your word holy lives as examples to us all, and the courage to know and do the truth through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Heavenly Father, your Holy Spirit gives to one the word of wisdom and to another the word of knowledge and to another the word of faith. We praise you for the gifts of grace, wisdom, knowledge, and faith imparted to your servant, David Cetron. And we pray that by his teaching and through his words this afternoon, we may be led to a fuller knowledge of the truth which we have seen in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. It's my pleasure to say, it's my pleasure to say a few words about uh, Rebecca Price and Lois. And, um, and Mary Labar. Um, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not old enough to have known any of them personally. Jim, did you, did you, you knew Mary Labar personally, I believe? And uh, Jim is a former student of Mary's from, from, uh, from back when. And uh, uh, they sound like remarkable women. And I think it's, it's a, a notable fact that, uh, that one of Wheaton's longest standing endowed chairs is named after these three remarkable women. Um, Rebecca Price joined the Wheaton College faculty immediately after receiving her PhD at the age of 27 at one of the finest institutions in the United States, New York University. And she joined the, the faculty here in 1936 and immediately began to strengthen existing Christian education courses. And with, it, within just a few years, the Department of Christian Education was established and she led that department until 1952, at which time she accepted an invitation to establish a similar department at the then brand new Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. The impact of Becky Price on colleagues and uh, on students can only be described as phenomenal. She was a superb classroom teacher, able to motivate students to do their best, 
And during her time at Wheaton, she was a radiant testimony as she underwent extensive cancer treatment, understanding that, that in the last 15 years of her life, she taught from a wheelchair as a paraplegic. She was a sought after speaker who shared her vision for Christian education across the country. She was a strong advocate for the Reformation doctrine of the ministry of all believers. And Christian education's purpose was to equip, in her mind, to equip Christians to feed themselves spiritually. She desired to train her students to be more than merely theological consumers, but help them to be persons who could mine the depths of scripture on their own. She sounds like a remarkable person. She was uh, joined by Lois and Mary Labar, uh, doctor, doctors Lois and Mary Labar, who joined the Christian Education Department from 1948 through their uh, uh, joint uh, retirement in 1975. Mm -hmm. So they picked up uh, right where Rebecca left off, overlapping for a number of years. After which time, uh, after they left Wheaton in retirement, they went on to establish a Christian liberal arts college in Zimbabwe, of course. So uh, they, were the sound, they sound like they have boundless energies. The Labars brought a wealth of both practical ministry experience and academic training to their jobs. Before joining the Wheaton faculty, Mary had been in involved in Jewish evangelism near the University of Chicago. Lois came as an exp experienced curriculum writer and teacher. Shortly after beginning their teaching at Wheaton, they received a leave of absence and both completed their doctorates at New York University following in Dr. Price's steps. And they soon distinguished themselves as leaders in Christian education. The current association, Evangelical Professors of Christian Education, stems from their work in the late 1940s. Lois Labar's book, Education That is Christian, remains as a premier statement of evangelical educational philosophy. It was reviewed saying it is an eloquent call for creative use of the Bible throughout the entire educational system of Christian education. This conceptual leadership of the Labars in the field of education today continues through their books and numerous students who have assumed positions in educational leadership, uh, exemplified by our esteemed colleague, uh, Jim Pluteman here, who was uh, their, one of their students. The Labars excelled in classroom teaching. Their careers were marked by a desire to let good educational and uh, biblical ministry theory inform a pra the practice of Christian education. Consequently, they were concerned that their students have an opportunity to practice what they learned in the classrooms. Mary and, and Lois, along with their students, were actively involved in Christian community service and education. They sound like exemplary people. So these are the three women we celebrate as we uh, install a, a worthy recipient of the, 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 ch the chair named in their, uh, in their honor. So that's uh, your, your thoughts on uh, the Labars. Barrett? It's a special treat for me to introduce uh, Dr. Setrin to you. We started within one year of each other, though you can tell to look at us. He's aged a lot better than I have. <laughs> he seems to have found the fountain of youth. Um, Dr. Setrin is uh, one of our own here. He is an alumnus of Wheaton College twice over, uh, earning both his BA and his MA at Wheaton College. During those years, Dave felt God's call in his life and a growing passion about developing a vision for education that was true to the biblical witness and to the Christian worldview as a whole. He earned a PhD in the history of education from Indiana University in 2000 and has been serving on the faculty of the Christian Formation and Ministry Department since then. And as uh, Dr. Baumgartner referred to, he is just beloved by students and by faculty alike. Dr. Setrin's research interests include the history and philosophy of Christian education, emerging adult development and formation, and the theory and practice of character formation. He's the author of The College Why, uh, Student Religion in the Era of Secularization, and also co-author with Chris Kiesling of Spiritual Formation in Emerging Adulthood. And I recommend that you pick it up. It's an excellent book, uh, recent publication, A Practical Theology of College and Young Adult Ministry. Dr. Setrin and his wife, Holly, have four children, Parker, uh, who's out at Biola, Anna Joy, Owen, and Emily. And on beautiful days like today, you will often find, in fact, if David wasn't speaking in here, he would probably be over on the tennis courts with his son, Owen. I don't recommend challenging him. I made that mistake many years ago and learned my lesson and won't, <laughs> won't be doing that again. Um, also, at this particular time of year, on beautiful days like this, Dave's blood begins to churn with spring training happening down south. Uh, despite all these years in Chicago, he's still a Yankees fan, but we won't hold that against him. So I speak on behalf of the CFM department, I am sure, in saying that we are delighted to have Dr. Setrin represent us 
represent Rebecca Price and the Labar sisters in his new role as the Price Labar Professor of Christian Education. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Setram. Well, it is a delight, absolutely, to be here, and I'm humbled, uh, certainly, by the honor of filling this Price Labar chair, in part because Lois Labar is one of the reasons um, that I'm teaching here at Wheaton College. Um, as an MA student, I wrote my thesis on her contributions to our discipline, and though I was always captivated by her thinking, um, I was even more fascinated by the ways that she embodied the life of a Christian teacher, uh, rigorous, creative, passionate. In any given week, one could find her teaching through tears in the classroom, working alongside students in their internships, and hosting Saturday morning pancake breakfasts at her house on Howard Street. Uh, the terminology might not have been in vogue at the time, but spiritual formation in emerging adulthood was the heartbeat of her life, and a legacy that has shaped me and our department in very profound ways. My interest in this topic uh, is also related to my own experience um, at Wheaton and in subsequent years. My life was transformed uh, through my undergraduate time here, um, through professors and RAs, through chapel, uh, through the Office of Christian Outreach, through my time on the tennis team. Um, much of this sparked a lifelong desire to return this investment by working alongside students in both the church and the academy and to study the dynamics of spiritual formation among those who are in the 18 to 29 year old demographic. Uh, but I would be remiss to uh, discount the role that parenting uh, has also played uh, in my interests. The fact that my oldest son is now a first year college student um, and that I will be sending three more off to college in the next six years um, has provided more than enough incentive uh, to think hard about these issues. Thankfully, my arrival at Wheaton in the fall of 1999 corresponded closely with the beginnings of a broader scholarly conversation in psychology and sociology, proposing a new stage of the lifespan, emerging adulthood, to fill the growing gap in post-industrial societies between adolescence on the one hand and the achievement of full adulthood on the other. Over the last 50 years, all of the standard sociological markers of adult status, uh, including the big five of leaving home, finishing school, landing a job, getting married, and having children have all been delayed. In 1960, over two-thirds of Americans had attained all five of those markers by the age of 30. By the year 2000, this was true of less than half of females and less than a third of males. Many know that the boomerang generation uh, leaving home has itself become something like a circular migration. These delays are the result of a number of factors um, that I'll only mention briefly. The move from a manufacturing to a service and information-based economy has extended higher education, uh, delaying financial independence and therefore marriage and parenting and establishing a household. But other reasons as well, the decoupling of sexual experience and marriage, fueled by the growing cultural tolerance for premarital sexuality and the advent of easy and reliable birth control methods. Uh, the expansion of educational opportunities and vocational expectations for women. Declining anticipated family size, allowing for a later start to the childbearing years. Parental willingness to subsidize children in the midst of these delays. And even a larger cultural denigration of adulthood uh, that labels the early 20s as the best time of life because of its link to cultural values of freedom, possibility, and physical attractiveness and strength. Adulthood in such a context is envisioned less as a desired achievement and more like the death of a dream. In addition to these delays, 20-somethings uh, today experience a much more disjointed pathway to adult status. And the best way I can show this, actually, I think, is by looking, if I can get this up there, at the popular board game, uh, Life. Move this ahead a couple. Um, created in 1960, uh, the original life reflected basic cultural presuppositions about the sequencing of the adult life course. After securing a career, the events of the journey became very carefully scripted. Within a turn or two, everyone stops at the church, yes, the church, to get married. Another role leads one to the purchase of a house, 
and after this come the pink and blue children that populate your home and your automobile as you travel down life's highway. The cultural script is clear and uniform. Higher education, career, marriage, a home, parenting, um, all fairly early in the adult journey. Compare this with the 2005 version of the game called Life, <laughs> Twists and Turns. Um, note the tagline, a thousand different ways to live your life, you choose. The board no longer consists of linear movement through a uniform social script. Instead, it now has four loops. Earn it, making money. Learn it, um, for learning higher education, but also life skills. Live it, adventures, like becoming a contestant on a reality TV show. <laughs> and love it, uh, relationships with optional marriage and parenting. One must determine time and time again, and in no particular order, which loop to enter. And you win not by doing well within the prescribed script, but rather by earning the most life points through your experiences, measured by swiping your credit card in the life pod at the end of the game. As this game reveals, emerging adults live today with the question that has become Microsoft's motto, where do you want to go today? Needless to say, these changes have reoriented also the psychological landscape for young adults. Consider how much more is required psychologically when the range of alternatives seems endless, when there's no uniform itinerary to provide guidance, and when one travels with little collective support. In defining this as emerging adulthood, uh, Jeff Arnett uh, identified five common traits among those in this age group. First, they are engaged in identity formation. Second, their lives are marked by instability, regular moving, changing jobs and romantic partners, and revising their life plans. Third, they are very self-focused, free from parents' oversight, and yet also free from significant responsibilities to others. Fourth, they feel in between, recognizing that they have transcended adolescence, but not quite sure if they've reached adult status. And fifth and finally, they live in an age of possibilities, desirous of keeping all their options open, and yet also a bit anxious about the responsibilities that such choices imply. My guess is that many of us implicitly recognize that this is challenging soil in which to cultivate the life of the spirit. Anecdotally, we hear a lot about uh, emerging adult exodus from the church, the so-called black hole in local congregations that portends the demise of institutional Christianity. A cottage industry has developed around the fear of students losing faith in college, either through skepticism or the anything goes social climate of the campus. Crime, delinquency rates, at-risk behaviors all spike in these years. And research is fairly consistent in proclaiming this stage to be the developmental low point when it comes to subjective religious experience and religious practice. When comparing 18 to 23 year olds with the teenagers below them, research has found significant declines among emerging adults in those claiming that faith is very or extremely important in shaping their daily life. In addition, only 35% of conservative Protestant emerging adults indicate that they feel extremely or very close to God, down from 48% among teenagers in the same group. Yet the largest declines are actually related to practice. In addition to drops in church attendance, a host of other spiritual disciplines become less prominent in the emerging adult years. Daily prayer, Bible reading, Sabbath observance, religious singing, uh, reading of devotional materials, even personal evangelism. Christian Smith claims that emerging adults are, on most sociological measures, the least religious adults in the United States today. Lower than teenagers, lower than those in their 30s and beyond. So the Shakespearean call of King Henry V to stiffen the sinews and summon up the blood and once more go unto the breach um, seems an appropriate call. Now there are some caveats. We need to be cautious about our tendency to evaluate changes as historical rather than developmental, as when we hear all this hand-wringing about those millennials. Um, as those in older generations look at 20-somethings, they often perceive disheartening generational shifts. But most research seems to show something more like a consistent age-based decline among conservative Protestants with little substantive change since the 1970s. So while Catholics have seen real historical declines in the percent of emerging adults attending church over the past 40 years, 
within conservative Protestantism, there's actually been little change. So while emerging adulthood does represent a low point, it's not really a story of decline over time as much as an age-based slump that has been relatively consistent. The historical changes that are taking place, incidentally, relate more to declines in emerging adult nominal faith. For example, while regular church attendance has remained stable, the numbers attending just a few times a year, for example, has declined significantly, while the number never attending has grown substantially. Likewise, while the number reporting prayer daily has remained consistent, uh, the number praying only occasionally, less than once a week, has declined, while the number never praying has risen. So historical decline represents more of an erosion at the margins, um, may be reflective of diminished social pressure to engage in these activities. So these caveats do give a more nuanced perspective, but they don't change the fact uh, that these are still real developmental declines. In a decade of life where fundamental beliefs are forged, critical life decisions made, and life patterns solidified. Amidst these statistics, these are real people, family members and friends, many of whom we can probably picture in our minds. In addition, as financial analysts like to point out, uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. There is some indication we may be reaching a historical inflection point. Um, sociologist Robert Wuthnow has argued that for those who do leave the church in their early 20s, re-engagement, if it happens at all, tends to be associated with marriage and parenting. Yet with the delays of marriage associated with emerging adulthood and the rise of cohabitation, that re-engagement is happening later or not at all. Sociologist Jonathan Hill has argued that the increased length of time away from the church, this driver's license to marriage license hiatus, um, seems to be correlated with a decreased likelihood of return. So in light of these realities, um, I'd like to discuss the challenge of spiritual formation during emerging adulthood, but also the opportunities that this stage provides for furnishing the adult life as a deep habitation of the spirit. Um, once more unto the breach uh, we go. The decline of spiritual formation among emerging adults is obviously related to many things, but some of them relate to our cultural assumptions regarding the purpose of the 20s. With a clear sense that adult responsibilities are coming, emerging adulthood is perceived often as a limited window of fun, freedom, and exploration prior to settling down. Of course, this is quite true. It is a unique stage defined by significant freedom. Yet within this framework, the pursuit of one's faith is often viewed as an adult task, coordinated in time with marriage and parenting and career. At that point, after they have gotten all the fun and exploration out of their systems, they will assume traditional adult roles, including church participation and attentiveness to the spiritual life. For now, however, the 20s are often labeled as my time. Linked closely with this, emerging adults may fail to recognize the connection between the present and the future. Uh, this decade is often viewed as a hermetically sealed sphere of activity uh, that will have little influence on ability to live a spiritually engaged future adult life. So Christian Smith, in his interviews with emerging adults, uh, said this, the assumption seems to be whatever happened in my early 20s stays in my early 20s, and the memories and behavioral consequences will never haunt them down the road. Some of this, of course, is the nature of the aging process. Emerging adults feel maybe that they have an infinite amount of time in front of them, a reality that diminishes the importance of the present and makes it seem as if life can be continually modified later on. I liken this to an Etch-a-Sketch, um, an ancient toy uh, that some of the elderly among us used to enjoy, in which you use two knobs to draw patterns on a screen and then shake to erase when you're ready to start over. Many feel they can take part in the lifestyles and practices of their 20s and at age 30, shake to erase um, or flip a switch to start anew. The problem with this perspective is that it fails to account for what educator John Dewey once called the experiential continuum. According to Dewey, no experience lives unto itself. Every experience builds on previous experiences and lays the foundation for subsequent experiences. Each sketch, in other words, leaves a subtle trace that becomes more evident and more directional over time, forming grooves that begin to shape future drawings in certain paths. For Christian collegians, the common belief is that someday, 
in five or 10 years perhaps, they will assume the form of the man or woman that they picture in their dreams. Um, and for many, there's actually good reason to think that the future is the right time for dreams to become a reality. Emerging adulthood is by any measure a time of transience and instability. Whether in college, graduate school, early career, um, there's constant moving, shifting relationships, changing jobs. And in this state that I call the perpetual temporary, it's easy to see why emerging adults neglect attentiveness to spiritual practices. It can feel futile to really invest deeply in such things when they anticipate yet another transition in the near future. Many feel they are postponing spiritual attentiveness until a time when geographical and relational stability will provide the necessary time and space for deep spiritual investment. I have many conversations with students that begin with, when I'm finally done with college and finally settled, then, or when I'm finally married and settled. Um, those of us who are older adults might need to let emerging adults in on our dark secret. <laughs> Life rarely ever becomes settled in the ways that we imagine. At least I'm still waiting <laughs> for that to happen. The someday perspective um, is also fostered, I think, by the normal distractions of what Tim Clydesdale has called daily life management. Juggling academic and job responsibilities, setting up bank accounts, paying bills, uh, local and long distance relationships. Many of these tasks are new in emerging adulthood and so take a good deal of time. In addition, they tend to be immediately evaluated and rewarded thus elevating them on the priority scale. It's not surprising that such uh, distractions can lend work hard, play hard rhythms um, to move in whiplash fashion from task completion to blowing off steam. It's also not surprising that they can compromise spiritual attentiveness since few are evaluating and rewarding them for their devotion in these areas. As Clydesdale suggests, the norm as students enter college is metaphorically to place their beliefs and spiritual practices in a lockbox, stowed away for safekeeping until a later time when they will have achieved success and will now have time to re-engage such concerns. So faith is neither abandoned nor pursued, but rather safely stowed. Envisioning a godly future can be a very helpful activity. Emerging adulthood is a time for dreaming. But if it is not accompanied by a recognition of the continuity between the present and the future, it can also be a means of self-deceit. For collegians, dreams of future kingdom exploits can blur the fact that the future is shaped by the ways they're living out their current calling as students. Spiritual formation in emerging adulthood thus requires what I would call a harvest mentality. Galatians 6, 7 to 9 utilizes agricultural imagery to describe the process of formation in time. Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please the sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The images here speak to the gradual process by which the sowing of seed leads to a harvest. That slow but deliberate process, it seems, is related to the initial warning, do not be deceived. The potential for deception is at least partially related to the span of time between the sowing and the reaping. On the one hand, sowing to please the sinful nature does not always produce its negative fruit quickly. And so an emerging adult may be deceived into thinking that a life of sinful pleasure has little impact on future faithfulness. One might consider the widespread uh, belief that current pornography use will have no bearing on a future chaste marriage, for example. The lack of visible decline, however, cannot erase the subtle decay that is gradually reshaping the heart. The absence of observable fruit does not imply that the seed is dormant, just that the poisonous growth is happening beneath the soil, beneath conscious awareness. The problem with the idea of, getting, of using the 20s as a time to get sinful passions worked out of our systems is that engagement in these passions tends to do the exact opposite. It works these things into their systems in ways that will be challenging to extricate later on. Medical doctor Jeffrey Satinover says, sin not only represents a simple momentary failure of the will, but progressively weakens and undermines the will. With each successive step, we progressively lose the ability to turn around and yet are unaware of this worsening insidious moral incapacitation. According to Satinover, habitual patterns produce real physiological changes in the brain. 
forming grooves and neural pathways that facilitate repetition. As we practice certain behaviors, they become easier and easier, he says. And as they become easier, we become more likely to choose them. The more we choose them, the more deeply embedded they become. And what started out as relatively free becomes ever less so as time goes on. While it is tempting to argue with oneself that current paths can be altered, the reality is that by the time the future arrives, the altered self may no longer possess the willful desire to make such a change. The key is really to encourage emerging adults to engage formation, not someday, but today, so that they will not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It's important to remember, however, that this harvest deception cuts both ways. Just as sowing to the flesh might not bear immediate negative fruit, sowing to the spirit may fail to show immediate positive results. The potential deception here is to think that sowing to the spirit is unproductive. I'm not changing, so why continue? This is part of the reason that living by faith and not by sight is so important. In a world of instant feedback, the slow and patient cultivation of the soul can seem both restraining and unrewarding. Emerging adults have often not lived enough of life to see the ways in which spiritual formation bears gradual fruit over the course of years and decades. The repeated appeal of Galatians 6 is therefore critical. Don't become weary in doing good. Don't give up. This is actually one reason why emerging adults need connections with older adults. It may very well take older mentors both to exemplify the gradual journey and to encourage emerging adults that the path is worthwhile, to commend a long obedience in the same direction. This may in fact be one of the greatest gifts that parents and faculty and staff and older church members can provide, the gift of an embodied life course, a visible case study of spiritual formation over time, where many present moments over years have constructed a lifelong trajectory of faith. Along these lines, it's also important to note that sowing to the spirit can lead to perceptions of spiritual regression. Emerging adults practicing spiritual disciplines often perceive themselves to be in spiritual decline because they see and feel more of their sin and the gaping chasm between their hearts and God's holiness. For those expecting the disciplines to help them do better and feel better, this can be a jarring experience. However, as we guide them through these emotions, we must help them see that the work of the Spirit, the Spirit is at work, um, awakening a dependence on Christ. The growing recognition of sin, in other words, can helpfully lead them to despair of their own attempts at self-improvement, to puncture their pride and self-righteousness so that they are thrown back upon the cross. Such practices bring them back to the realization that they're not only saved by grace, but must live on the grace of God. In these moments, they are actually re-evangelized to the gospel. So the bottom line um, is that the decade of the 20s is a critical time for the shaping of the heart's loves. Calvin philosopher Jamie Smith says that we are lovers at our core, people whose lives are oriented by their ultimate longings and by their worship. These loves are aimed always towards certain ends, visions of human flourishing, visions of the good life that capture the imagination and motivate our actions. There's a reason that sin is portrayed biblically as idolatry, exchanging the love and worship of the Creator for the worship of the created things, and as adultery, the heart straying from its first love and giving the love God deserves to others. Sin is, as Augustine indicated, a disordering of our loves. Therefore, most of the, one of the most important questions that emerging adults can be asking, as Stephen Garber has noted, is not just what am I learning to know or what am I learning to do, but what am I learning to love? The alarming reality um, is that emerging adults may be developing a particular worldview, even the kind absorbed at a place like Wheaton, and yet their loves may be oriented in a very different direction. If you ask students at Wheaton what they should love best, almost all of them will give you the right answer but they must recognize they can profess to love one thing while their hearts and imaginations have been captured by something else, something that at least partially explains that intractable gap between knowing and doing. And here's the rub. Loves are shaped not only through stated beliefs, but also through the regular routines of their daily practices. Emerging adults' daily rhythms are not just things they do, these practices are doing something to them forming their dispositions and inclinations in ways that are powerful in part because they're hidden within the flow of normal life. 
the activities in which they take part, the media they consume, the stores and websites they frequent, all carry with them love-shaping visions of flourishing. They carry with them implicit gospels, visions of sin and redemption and eschatological hope. And such narratives can begin to subtly shift the story that emerging adults see themselves within and the loves that animate their hearts. At the gym, sin might be depicted as excess body fat, redemption as daily fitness, and ultimate hope as the perfectly sculpted physique. TV commercials portray sin as material lack, redemption through consumer purchases, and eschatological hope as the good life, surrounded by your possessions and always more than your neighbor. Marketers rarely provide information about a product. Instead, they vividly portray a life of flourishing and invite you to be a character in that story through your purchases. Apple doesn't sell features of iPhones and iPads in its advertising. It sells alluring stories of the good life that elicit the heart's desires. It provides quite literally a call to worship. When we treat our students as what Smith would call brains on a stick um, and think that information is the only thing that shapes them, we might miss this potent reality. The passionate communication of biblical truth is foundational in spiritual formation. But as Dallas Willard has reminded us, our mind on its own is an extremely feeble instrument whose power over life we constantly tend to exaggerate. We are incarnate beings, and we live also from our bodies. If we are to be transformed, the body must also be transformed, and that is not accomplished by talking at it, as he puts it. So how can mentors foster this formation of loves, this gradual harvest? Well, let me briefly mention a series of postures and practices of sowing to the spirit that I think may be helpful in reorienting and recalibrating emerging adults' loves. Uh, for easier recall, and as my students know, I love to do this, they all start with the letter R. Um, I'm a frustrated preacher, I think, at some, at some level. But first, um, mentors can foster reflection on their practices. So Smith speaks of the need for a liturgical audit, a regular examination of the habitual routines of our lives. In recent days, I've been asking my students a new question. Where is your body taking your heart? I find that it is a startling, sometimes disconcerting question, um, and yet it helpfully shifts the perspective to help them open eyes to the love-shaping power of their everyday experiences. As the subconscious is made conscious and the familiar made strange, they can at least be alerted to the ways their hearts are being trained to love rival kingdoms. They may enter certain shopping spaces differently. They may watch shows and commercials differently. They may use their electronic devices differently, always asking, how are these things shaping my loves? This is not necessarily a call to limit these activities, though it might be, um, but they will hopefully enter such spaces with their love detectors engaged. This is an important first step. Yet reflection will rarely be sufficient. If the shaping of the heart's loves is taking place through our practices, then the reshaping of loves will typically require counterformational practices that foreground the nature of the kingdom and the narrative of the kingdom in the heart's affections. False loves cannot just be identified and rejected, they have to be replaced. Christian formational practices or rituals, um, such as spiritual disciplines and the liturgies of the church, are central in connecting emerging adults to loves, gospel-fueled loves, while breaking their automatic habits that can dull the beauty of kingdom life. I'll mention the church near the end, but regular disciplines are also essential. Disciplines of abstinence, things like solitude and silence and fasting and frugality, both alert the soul to false loves and open up spaces to attend to Christ. These disciplines often serve, at least for me, as love diagnostics. Um, when something is removed, food, computers, verbal praise, material goods, we begin to feel our longings and the ways that these things have taken on disproportionate importance in our lives. For example, solitude will often provoke an ache in the absence of others' feedback, online or otherwise. Frugality may spark an emptiness that helps us see the ways we satiate our souls with purchases. Fasting does the same with food. And while we may verbalize correct phrases about our Christian desires, these disciplines experientially force the question, what do we really want? Is God enough, or do I functionally live with a heart posture that says, if only? And by removing competing loves for a time, we also create room to taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Fasting leads to feasting on God, silence to hearing his still small voice, frugality to purchasing wine and milk without money and without cost. They provide room, that is, for disciplines of engagement, reading and studying scripture, prayer, worship, celebration, service, confession. Aquinas said that love is born of an earnest consideration of the thing loved, something unlikely to happen in our distracted age without intentional practices given to gazing on his beauty. To say no to these alluring idols requires a more compelling yes. And so we need such counterformational practices because they serve as centripetal forces in emerging adults' lives, helping them maintain their orbit around the fixed point of Christ at a time when they are prone to wander. The importance of these rituals should lead us here at Wheaton uh, to consider an important reality. The classes we teach also consist of rituals. And this means we as faculty must be very intentional not only about content, but about our class liturgies. Daily experiences of reading, writing papers, studying, classroom discussions, laboratory work are shaping emerging adults in profound ways. This is what is so frightening about Christian education. Students can learn the Christian worldview in class and yet be immersed in practices, a kind of hidden curriculum, that contradict that worldview at the same time. Such work can develop postures of pride and envy and image management and self-sufficiency and a critical spirit, everything contrary to the depiction of love we see in 1 Corinthians 13. So what can be done? Well, we can encourage students to reflect on the ways their souls are being formed through their educational practices, helping them recognize that these daily uh, tasks are actually forming their loves. After talking with my own students about this, one recognized that her involvement in class discussions was moving her in the direction of pride and self-love. Her attentiveness to this reality led her to watch for this, but also to engage a few new rituals. She began taking notes on other students' responses in class. She tried to talk to one student at the end of every class expressing thanks for that individual's insights. She prayed before class that her comments would bless others and not fuel her pride. Practices like this helped her enter discussions as offering and receiving academic gifts rather than vying for self-promotion. Along with this, uh, those who are faculty can work to develop our own counterformational rituals. I know a colleague who has students keep a prayer journal as part of class designed to document praise and worship and confession unearthed through course content. Another directs students to practices of prayer before and after reading assignments. Another has students sign a covenant related to the ways that they will pray for and treat each other in the classroom. Each class will have a different rhythm, but can we be more intentional, I guess, about our liturgies and the loves that are shaped through them? Third R, in addition to reflection and rituals, a third key is remembering. Celebrating the great works of God in scripture, in history, and in their own lives. At this time of life, in emerging adulthood, attention is often fixed on the present and the future alone. But scripture continually highlights the importance of looking back, of remembering. In the Old Testament, feasts and festivals tied to the agricultural calendar brought to mind God's works on Israel's behalf. The people were regularly commanded through physical objects such as altars and stones to actively remember God's provision. The love-shaping benefits of remembering are manifold in emerging adulthood, but let me mention just two. In Deuteronomy 8, we read, Do not forget the Lord. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and a series of other things, you may then say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. For emerging adults, the accomplishment of this stage, building literal homes, but also careers and reputations, can easily swell the ego by setting them up as the architects of their own success. Competence can foster what Walter Brueggemann once called self-groundedness, the belief that our life springs from us, that we generate our own power and vitality. Remembering can be a powerful antidote to such self-love, reminding them that all of their achievements are the result of God's gracious provision in their lives, that adulthood itself is grateful stewardship rather than a self-made triumph. In addition, remembering can counter the self-absorption of this time of life. If remembering fosters a view of my own blessedness, it can also furnish a desire to bless others. This is the logic of grace. Recognition of forgiveness generates forgiveness of others. If emerging adults perceive their lives in terms of scarcity, 
They are apt to turn to idols and to use other people to get what they need. But if they view themselves as favored and blessed, they are apt to graciously give out of that overflow to bless others. Our consumer culture reinforces continually a sense of deficit. Regular reflection on God's mercies, though, can foreground gratitude, which in many ways becomes the engine of sacrificial love. So to ask, how do we help emerging adults take part in what Richard Baxter once called aggravating the mercies of God, uh, stirring them to remembrance and celebration so that his great works stay at the forefront of their minds? Just as the Israelites utilized altars and stones, mentors can encourage emerging adults to fashion reminders of God's provision. At a time when everything is in transition, emerging adults desperately need Ebenezer's, places to pitch their flags in the ground to signify, thus far the Lord has helped us. As we help emerging adults see Christ's work in their stories, generating spiritual timelines that are far different than those created on Facebook, we direct worship toward the source of every good gift. And in the process, they gain confidence that he who began this good work will carry it on to completion. A fourth R is rhetoric. Um, Christian Smith has noted that emerging adults are remarkably inarticulate about their faith. Unable to express in speech the simplest of theological convictions, while speaking in vague God talk uh, can happen, they appear to be unable to verbalize the particularities of the faith. They can speak of God, he said, but Jesus gets caught in their throats. In part, this comes from a sense that beliefs themselves are relatively unimportant. Since a healthy moral framework is really all that matters, the stories of the Bible and the content of the faith are viewed as trivial minutia. But inarticulacy also comes from a lack of opportunity. Uh, think about this, Kara Powell at Fuller Seminary noted that as few as 10% of Christian teenagers have regular, at least weekly, conversations with their parents about faith, either in family devotions or just in the flow of life. Ken DeCreasy Dean at Princeton similarly notes that youth groups are often devoid of opportunities to articulate the storyline of the Bible or the nature of the gospel or the creeds of the faith. And as Amanda Drury recently suggested in her interesting book, Saying is Believing, uh, there's a close link between articulation and reality. For something to seem real and important, it must be verbalized and expressed. It is absolutely critical for emerging adults to hear and to utilize the language of Christianity, the creeds, the doctrines, the biblical vocabulary of the faith. They need to share their testimonies and hear others' testimonies using this language. Um, they're very fluent in the language of popular culture, speaking about these things on a daily basis and thus reinforcing their loves. An absence of biblical vocabulary will leave them woefully lacking when it comes to seeing and constructing an alternate identity and an alternate love. Adopting, memorizing, and utilizing such language is one way that emerging adults can enter deeply enough into the Christian narrative to kindle their loves and to resist the cultural slogans around them. A fifth R, roles. Christian Smith also has suggested that within American culture, the 20s are about two things, having as much fun as possible and setting yourself up for future success. Yet God has lavished emerging adults with gifts, passions, unique opportunities, not just for personal gain, but so that they can steward what Amy Sherman has called their vocational power for the common good. The freedom of emerging adulthood should not be a freedom from constraints as much as a growing freedom for others. If Christian spiritual formation is a matter of being conformed to the image of Christ, this entails not only growing in Christ-like character, but also embracing a commitment to Christ's mission to proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom in all areas of life. Strong love formation in the next generation of Christian leaders will not be cultivated by just treating emerging adults as passive learners and consumers. They must be entrusted with genuine responsibility to teach, to serve, to mend the world's broken places. We need what situated learning theorists call legitimate peripheral participation. Emerging adults contribute to God's missional purposes as they learn to use their gifts alongside others who are more experienced. Such apprenticeships are critical means of developing the skills and confidence for kingdom work, but they also serve to direct their loves to the things that Jesus loves, the love of neighbor that reflects an adult call to responsible action. So just 
as we're beginning to conclude, all these R's um, are critical means of shaping loves. Um, and yet I would argue that it is the way that these are reflected in the communal practices of the church that are really the most critical for retuning emerging adult hearts to the gospel. Think about the R's in this context. It is here in the rituals surrounding word and table that emerging adults are repeatedly immersed into the narrative of the kingdom, the story that defines their identities. That weekly call to corporate confession and repentance and worship promotes humble receptivity, a recognition that they are not just learning to stand on their own two feet, but are rather sustained within a community of faith. Churches call emerging adults to remembering. The liturgical calendar calls us to the great works of God. The Eucharist, do this in remembrance of me. The teaching of Bible stories, which should continue beyond childhood, remind them of God's greatness um, and solidify identity. The church calls them to rhetoric through the recitation of scriptures and creeds, the singing of songs, the sharing and receiving of testimonies. They're called into roles within the body of Christ as they use their gifts to build others up and beyond as they are sent to be salt and light. We often talk about convincing emerging adults that they need the church, but it's equally true that the church needs them, that their absence in such roles represents a real loss to the community of faith. But one more R becomes absolutely critical here, relationships. Jeff Arnett notes that emerging adults define adulthood as three things, taking responsibility for myself, making independent decisions, and becoming financially independent. You might note a common theme. <laughs> Independence, really a separation from authoritative communities, is often seen as the very definition of adulthood. In the church, however, there's a recognition of a very different adult vision, a belief that the growing and sustaining of God-directed loves requires a community, requires a family. It is in the local church that emerging adults submit to the authority of pastors and elders, giving these leaders permission to hold them accountable to beliefs and practices. So dispelling the myth of the self-determined individual, church membership actually asks for communal safeguards to protect one's loves from the deceitful schemes of the world, the flesh, and the devil. A pastor shepherd can provide this in a way that a podcast cannot. It is in the church that emerging adults admit that they need the gifts of others to become the adults that God is calling them to be. The local church embodies in very tangible ways a recognition of need, a sense that one cannot reach maturity without the contributions of others, including those who appear different or inferior in terms of intellect or status. Organically connected to one another, they open themselves up to be joined and held together by every supporting ligament. And when life is pulling in the direction of autonomy, this is one of the most important means of ensuring that adulthood will also maintain the humble and dependent posture of the child. In related fashion, it is in the church that they find older mentors. The 20s represent the most monogenerational period of the lifespan. <laughs> As Christian Smith put it, most emerging adults live this crucial decade of life surrounded mostly by their peers, who have no more experience, insight, wisdom, or balance than they do. It is sociologically a very odd way to help young people come of age. In his own research, David Kinnaman found that most emerging adults have never had an adult friend other than their parents. Narrative identity theorists speak of the fact that adult identity is always plagiarized cobbled together and borrowed from friends, family members, and other adults within their sphere. As imitative beings, they need models to beckon forth their loves and their dreams. They learn to love by watching what others love and feeling pulled to walk in similar paths. And in a world where adulthood is dreaded, emerging adults need diverse exemplars of vibrant Christian adulthood, people who invite them into loves that are compelling. All of these benefits, you might notice, require a spirituality of dwelling, a willingness to take root in a community rather than perpetually shopping to locate the perfect consumer fit. It requires, I dare say, a choice to give up choices um, and to be immersed in all of the relational pain and dysfunction and joy of the local body. You see, in calling emerging adults to spiritual formation, we're calling them to count the cost. That cost is high. Jesus said, unless you give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. 
The harvest process of sowing to the Spirit at this time of life does involve opportunity costs in terms of the kingdoms of this world. The only way that young adults will enter into such a relationship when so much is at stake is if their loves are captivated by the person and work of Jesus Christ. When faced with that cost, one young man of Jesus' day considered the price too high. The rich young ruler was asked to sell everything to gain treasure in heaven, but he went away sad because he had great wealth. He saw his own riches as more beautiful than heavenly treasure. The cost was not worth it because his loves were oriented in a different direction. In John 6, many who heard Jesus' teaching counted the cost and said it was too high. This is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Jesus then turns to the disciples and asks really the question, you do not want to leave too, do you? It's a haunting question, and one that the spiritual breach in emerging adulthood reveals is too often answered in the affirmative. But Peter, speaking for all true disciples, replies, Lord, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, despite all his issues, Peter's loves had been formed in such a way that the cost seemed insignificant when placed alongside the beauty of his Savior. He was willing to give up all he had to gain that pearl of great price. At the cusp of adulthood, uh, my prayer is that through the work of the Holy Spirit and within these practices and in the church, emerging adults would know what they have, um, that as Paul prayed, their eyes would be enlightened in order that they may know the hope to which he has called them, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for those who believe. Amidst all of these loves uh, that are competing for their attention, that the animating question of their lives will be not Microsoft's, where do you want to go today, <laughs> but the far more restrictive and yet life-giving one, where else would we go? Thank you. That's it. Do we have time for questions? I didn't know if we had any time for questions. Does anybody want to ask? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fine if we don't. <laughs> we'll we'll have a time for conversation um, and refreshment. Out about. Perfect. All right, thank you. Do I need to use this microphone? Oh, yes. I need to use this microphone. I believe you do. And it's that part of it. That you do. Yes. <laughs> I've observed. Well, thank you so much, uh, David. I, it's, I'm thrilled that we have a Price Labar chair at Wheaton College. Um, I didn't have the, the privilege of knowing Dr. Price, but I did know the Labar sisters. Uh, in fact, as a youngster, uh, was once in the living room of their Howard Street home uh, during a brief period of time when I was stamp collecting, which was uh, an avid hobby of the Labar sisters. And they were thrilled to have somebody there that had duplicates that they didn't have yet. So I was very warmly received uh, into the Labar uh, household. Uh, also had a chance to read Education That Is, that is Christian uh, as a seminary student. It's just a rich uh, legacy uh, that those women have left for us uh, on this campus. And thrilled that you would be the holder uh, of this chair uh, for, for many reasons. Uh, I consider David a friend uh, as well as a colleague. We've had the opportunity to be in an advanced faith and learning seminar together. Uh, spent a lot of fall afternoons on the soccer sideline uh, watching our sons uh, play soccer. And we just so appreciate uh, your gentleness, David, your wisdom the intellectual rigor that you bring to your academic work, uh, the love for your students that just, just shines through uh, in, in, your, in your teaching. I really appreciate, particularly as a church historian, um, the, the, I think, rare combination of somebody who really loves the history of the church, what there is to learn from uh, the communion of the saints across time, but equally a passion for what's happening in the lives of, of young people today and how we can minister to them and really drawing the resources of the, of the history of the church and applying it uh, to the needs of, of students. What a privilege it is for us uh, on this campus to have such a reliable guide uh, on our students' journey through life and really a resource for the entire campus. Uh, I'm just seeing Paul Chelson here as our Vice President for Student Development knowing how much really student development uh, thrives on the, the input of our, of our whole uh, Christian formation department, uh, but, but David certainly included in that. I was glad that Dr. Uh, McRae recommended spiritual formation in the emerging adult years. 
And late in the book, uh, Dr. Setrin writes this, without question, emerging adulthood acts as a hinge moment in many individual lives. Caught in the liminal space between adolescence and adulthood, these years represent a pivot point for the soul. What is it that young people need at this pivot point? At this in-between juncture, mentors must help emerging adults open their eyes to God's work in their lives and in the world through attentiveness to the past, present, and future. And I think you've heard in today's lecture, uh, we have at least one such mentor on this campus. Uh, praise God, we have a lot of them. But um, someone open to, that can open our eyes to God's work in the world and in students' lives through attentiveness to the past, present, and future. We've benefited from that uh, in today's uh, lecture. It's my privilege um, to, uh, to pray for you, David. I'd like to ask you just to stand. Uh, I'm going to place a, a brotherly hand on you as I pray. I would encourage others here to stand as we close in prayer. Um, and you might just also, if you want to join in this prayer of blessing, uh, not only give an amen at the end, but just raise a hand of blessing upon David and his work. Father, I begin by offering gratitude to you, our God, for the legacy of those who have gone before us. I think of the wisdom, the integrity, the vision, the love represented in Dr. Price and in the sisters, Drs. Labar, in, uh, in their love for this campus, in their vision for Christ-centered education and for spiritual formation. We just rejoice in that. We honor that legacy. We, we recognize, Lord, that that le legacy lives on today in the lives of people in this room. Father, we are grateful for David Setrin, for your work of grace in his life, for bringing him to Wheaton College, for further education at Indiana University, for the experiences and gifts that you have used to shape his loves, the calling that you have given him as a faculty member at Wheaton College, and specifically now as the holder of the Price Labar Chair. We pray for your work of grace in his own soul. Lord, that there would be a, a deep settledness and peace in this sweet season of his life's calling as a faculty member at Wheaton College. Lord, a recognition that this is his someday. Um, this is the work uh, in so many ways to which you've called him. Father, we pray that you would bless him as a scholar, that, that he would uncover uh, rich truths from the history of the church, especially from the teaching of your word, that you would give him keen insight into the spiritual needs of today's emerging adults. And Lord, that you would do such a work of spiritual formation in his own soul that would overflow into the lives of his students. Lord, we pray that for what he sows by your grace, he would reap an abundant harvest. We pray, Lord, that his own uh, love for you in love for your word and love for others, would come to mark in a deep way the students who are in his classroom. And we would pray beyond that, Lord, for his impact in the lives of his colleagues, for the work of, your, of, of grace that you're doing in the life of his family in this season of life. And Lord, we pray that these things would be a blessing for our whole community and bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, there is a time of visiting, I guess. Yes, and we can move you refreshments. <laughs> yes, refreshments and all those hard questions that you wanted to ask Dr. Setrin. Uh, let's, uh, let's just thank him again.